supermassive, ultra, hypermassive, whatever you want to call them. But at some point, this flow would go in here and you're going to basically have an inversion of a black hole, whatever that means. That, I don't know. Is that going to create space time or space time itself expanding out? Is it going to create a quark gluon plasma that we may observe as what we believe to be a big bang? You finally flipped. It's been said that a real perpetual motion machine cannot exist. Do you agree or do you think we can get there? We just don't know how yet. It's basically a sphere. I realize it's two dimensions. And you're looking at it on a two dimensional screen, most likely. You know, it so happens that I've been studying thermodynamics recently, a subject that I started studying 50 years ago when I was like 12 years old or something. And um, I finally am trying to write down a, a clear understanding because it dovetails with a lot of things we've done in our physics project, looking at the structure of space time and quantum mechanics and things like this. But if we're assuming this is a sphere, the current thought is somewhere at the center, we're going to have basically figure eight knot and this is going to be current estimates down at the magnitude of about 10 to the negative eight meters so just to give a little bit of history so you know steam engines were a big thing in the 1700s late 1700s and people like james watt and so on were were um, figuring out how do you make a more efficient steam engine how do you take heat in the steam engine and turn it into mechanical work of turning wheels around to make a train go forward or, or to you know move you know to pump water out of a mine or something like this incredibly small incredibly larger for different particles and everything but as far as what we could actually conceive maybe a mote of dust or something like that really not something you're going to notice if you're cruising through space going any any multiple actually just cruising through space at all and we're thinking we have a radius of approximately 10 to the uh, to, uh the radius is actually about 10 to the 34 meters how the heck do i get that number okay not negative 34. well one over the plank length it's an assumption when you do that, you get some surprising things and not so surprising things. So you end up having a diameter. It's roughly about, well, let's do it over here. So total diameter, we're talking about 10. I think it's like 1.237. I'll attach a notebook with the calculations. Uh, 35 meters. Okay, so then in the 1820s, a chap called Sadi Carnot came along. He was a, a kind of a, he come from the sort of military political uh, family in France that was at sometimes in favor, at sometimes out of favor. But um, he was, he got interested in the question of just how efficient can you make a an engine, a steam engine, a heat engine. Um, and so he tried to work that out and he came up with a, a theory for that. Um, that was a sort of theoretical idea of what, a, a an idealized machine might be like it was interesting and I, and I still need to read more of what he wrote because i think it was one of the first places where the concept of an abstracted machine really arose i mean that comes in later in things like turing machine as an abstracted machine for doing computation but this was an abstracted machine for turning heat into mechanical work and he concluded things about the efficiency of that and the idea that you always had to have a hot part and a cold part, and that sort of you got uh, you got the mechanical work by sort of the interplay of the hot part and the cold part. Okay, if we're out here, what do we have? We have galaxies. Okay, we got stars. We've got stars, galaxies. They're swirling around. But there's also seems to be this dark energy, this this cosmological constant, if you would, that seems to be creating what many into it is expansion. What came out was the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially said that there, it wasn't possible to go, you could go from mechanical work to heat, but you couldn't go just back 
directly from uh, from heat to mechanical work. You couldn't you couldn't do that. So what arose was this idea of perpetual motion machines, perpetual motion machine of the first kind, and perpetual motion machine of the second kind. A perpetual motion machine of a, of the first kind is one that gets energy from nothing, that just that breaks the law of conservation of energy and just generates energy when there wasn't any energy there before. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind is one which breaks the second law of thermodynamics and goes back from the energy in the form of heat to energy of the form of mechanical work, when the second law says you can go from one to the other, but not, not back, so to speak. So what happened, the perpetual motion machine of the second kind, people have been claiming you can make them forever and ever and ever. Um, what does it really, what's really involved? Well, the problem is that in, we now know that heat is a kind of motion. It's the microscopic motion of molecules and so on. Um, and the, the fact that we sort of don't naturally go back from heat to mechanical work is the heat is all randomized and you'd have to line all those molecules up and get them all to go sort of in the same direction, which is what you can do. If you have a hot a reservoir and a cold reservoir, they sort of all flow from one to the other. Um, and and that's what, um, uh, and, and you need that some sort of organizing print organizing structure to sort of line up all that randomness that represents heat. Perhaps that's the case. Totally open to that. Perhaps my simple brain just thinks of it more as, well, if this is kind of like the most beautiful snow globe in the world, but you had some form of a pump or a hyper pump in the center, because when we do our calculation, we look back like, all right, there was, there was some very hot, dense state, and it appeared to be high entropy, but then it kind of smoothed out, and people argue back and forth. So what I'm thinking, just in the current state as we know it, and based upon at least what's in my head of our models, okay, so what happens if you had a source? You know that from electromagnetism. Well, if you have a source, you must have a sink. What if that sink is right around the same area? So by the way, the second law of thermodynamics was stated in various ways, but one way of stating it is heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a colder body to a hotter body. Uh, you, you get, you know, you, a hotter thing can make a colder thing hotter, but not the other way around. That's one statement. Another statement is basically that, that perpetual motion machines of the second kind don't exist, that it's not possible to just go take a lump of heat and generate mechanical work from it. Because in my mind, as we see, I can toss in uh, little, one of the cool animations that Echelon put together. Uh, if you have this highly articulate motion, if this thing is whirling around, that's like prime frequency there, it might be ingesting and extruding. What would it ingest? I don't know. What do we have? We've got galaxies, and the galaxies are flowing away, and we got supermassive black holes, whatever those things are, and they're gaining mass, and they're getting bigger. And apparently yesterday we found something within, I think it was our own galaxy, but it was eating about a solar mass a day. Well, that was a couple billion years ago, so probably pretty ginormous right now, because it was pushing the Eddington limit. So again, I believe we're going to probably keep on finding much larger and larger black holes, supermassive, ultra, hypermassive, whatever you want to call them. But at some point, this flow would go in here, and you're going to basically have an inversion of a black hole, whatever that means. That, I don't know. Is that going to create space-time or space-time itself expanding out? Is it going to create a quark gluon plasma that we may observe as what we believe to be a big bang? Using the expansion of materials as they got hotter because, you know, the reason they expand is because the atoms are bouncing around more and they have an easier time spending more time further away from each other. So that's why materials tend to get bigger when they get hotter. But that's what you do in, a, in a, an alcohol thermometer or a mercury thermometer. You're, you're seeing how this column of, of fluid gets expands as you heat the thing up. Possibly. Awesome. Now, the problem I run into with this is this made a lot of sense to me. I'm like, all right. 
you've got matter, space time, whatever it is, coming out. And according to, uh, oh, what is it, uh, Professor Sharma's paper, and I believe, uh, Jonathan, I forget your last name, but it was something that Dr. Unziker actually brought to our attention in that it's an old model where basically if you did happen to have a rotating universe, there was rotation. We were kind of spinning around in whatever direction. Well, that seems to be able to account for inertia. And I, I still need to go through the full paper. I meant to do it the other day. Question. There was a question of what is heat? And people didn't know what heat was. They thought it was a substance called phlogiston that was a, a fluid-like thing that would sort of suffuse substances and you could like have heat as a disembodied kind of uh, kind of material. Well, so the one thing I have, the one obvious question is, so it, it, like obviously there, then it has some tremendous amount of fluid dynamics because the outside can't, it would be a limit to how much anything could move because you, once you start expanding the outside of the pizza, you get, like even literally a pizza, if you spun the pizza, at like, like a record Volume must be maintained. RPM, once the pizza gets like to a certain size, the outside of the pizza will be going light speed or nearly light speed. Mm. And it won't even be that big of a pizza. It'll be a pizza like of a number probably with the radius we could at least discuss in some sort of real terms. So there would be then a tremendous amount of turbulence problems. Um, like everything that gives rise to the Navier-Stokes equations or all mm -hmm. those types of problems. Um, and every other types of, there's a, just a whole lot of geometric problems that will happen with the whole thing rotating like that. You know, that's if the whole thing is rotating so that it's radial, so that the rotation is greater as you go out. Yeah. You've got an inverse rotation, so that the rotation of the out is zero, and the rotation maximizes as you go towards the center, right? So that's... I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, because this this isn't even... To be fair, I would... Go on. So, no, so that's that's... That's exactly, there's yeah. a proposed solution to, yeah. if you're showing mm -hmm. it's an out. In fact, that problem becomes a, a, a crutch for yeah. your model because, I mean, a, a positive crutch, because it means there's a limit. If you're having things rotate, there's a limit, the speed of light. Yeah. That's faster to go. So if you're carving boundaries with that speed of light and creating divisions at that speed, yeah. you largely want that to be on the inside. Largely, that's my point, is that there, uh, there's some that rules. forces you to have yeah. a, there's a some distortion that's quanta, it's not infinite. Right? Exactly, there's some rules that very, very, greatly bound that because we can yeah. think about actual pizza that starts to challenge the issues mm -hmm. like it literally is made out of a crust with some sort of astronomical cheese and whatever but it's i i love i love that yeah. because my problem comes in with the crust that's that that's ultimately where i'm going i threw that in a little bit i don't think i had said on video before but i just want to give a shout out actually back in 1981 I wrote a little paper with a, a chap called Jan Ambjorn about, uh, we called it properties of the vacuum. And we talked about exactly this phenomenon of if you have different shaped boxes, you know, kind of what forces are there from the vacuum. And actually, interestingly enough, um, we worked out what was sort of what happens if you go from this shape of box to that shape of box and so on. And, and you know, noticed a few things about it. A few years go by. Get a letter from a chap called Robert Ford, who was a physicist and science fiction writer, actually. He says, are you sure your calculations are right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're right. He says, well, if your calculations are right, there is a closed cycle, like the Carnot cycle that uh, for heat engines, there's a closed cycle that extracts energy from the vacuum. And, and so he looked at this, and he's right, that... You know, the Casimir effect, this, this vacuum fluctuation effect, you can squidge the box, this shape and that shape, and you can make this closed cycle, and you can be just, you know, mining energy out of the vacuum. How can this possibly be? How can it possibly work? Well, the one feature of that is that idea, even if it didn't make it into science fact, definitely made it into science fiction. And I really am amused. I, a bunch of movies which where people are like, we're going to blow it up with, we're going to drive the spaceship with zero point fluctuations. We're going to, uh, you know, have a thing that, that uh, is a, a kind of a, a blow everything up with zero point fluctuations and so on, uh, which I think came from that, um, uh, you know, that investigation. Because the other thing that that would do is, uh, sorry, 
this a little bit label better. All right. But what that also does is in Jonathan Fay's paper, I believe, um, he basically takes that idea and says, well, what you could also do, the thing that would help to solidify that model is you would have a mass at the center. Like, uh, that seems to be what, what we're saying right here. And there's a lot of other ways we could go, but... You give me the idea that I wonder whether that kind of closed thermodynamic cycle actually works in space-time and whether there is a similar kind of phenomenon. Now, I, I should say that in our models of physics, the whole idea of vacuum fluctuations uh, is, is, is very much tied into the very structure of space itself. These things where you have sort of this quantum process that's happening, that is the, the rewriting of the structure of space. It's something that's sort of below the level of quantum gravity even. You're, you're seeing the structure of space is knitted together from all these things that you might describe as vacuum fluctuations, all these different kinds of microscopic processes. And so, so you would expect, and, and actually it's a, it's a good exercise. Okay, my, my homework exercise is to figure out whether you can make a, uh, a, a machine that will be a perpetual motion machine of the second kind operating on space-time. Uh, my guess actually is that you probably can do it, um, but that it probably leverages the, um, it, it probably is based on the expansion of the universe and it probably is essentially uh, sort of what you're doing is in the end, taking energy out of the expansion of the universe. That, you, that you're basically taking what would otherwise be an overall flow of expansion of the universe and you're saying, no, 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 I don't want to use that to just make the universe bigger. I'm going to use that locally to, you know, power my car or whatever. Uh, not, that, not that I think that's likely to be practical anytime soon. The big problem that I'm having is when you actually toss the calculations into Wolfram Alpha, my question is, and I have a potential idea for a solution about this with your guys' help, the hypersurface area. Because the area of a four-dimensional hypersphere is in three dimensions. I'm like... Well, we live in a realm that appears to be three dimensions, and we always separate it as three plus one. Three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. Now, my, my question is, where do we live? Do we live in the four-dimensional, which I could easily say, okay, I can intuit that. It's like time is in there because well, time is in here, or... Is it something along the lines of we live in the surface, a three-dimensional surface, and time is a flow flowing through all. There is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge stagnates without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The force is all things, and I am the force.